G'day you mob, Pete here from Aussie English, how's it going? Welcome to this episode of Aussie English, the number one place for anyone and everyone wanting to learn Australian English. Today I have the very first of three, count them, one, two, three, uh, episodes with my dear friend Ross McGibbon. So we sat down for a bit of a chat, we had a bit of a yarn, and it ended up being about an hour and a half, an hour and a half that we were chatting away about a bunch of different topics. In today's episode, part one, we kind of just have a free flow chat about what his life has been like over in Western Australia during COVID. He is an amazing reptile photographer. So, he's been going on trips and taking phenomenal photos of goannas, snakes, geckos, all kinds of awesome animals in WA. We talk about uh, handling snakes, having pet snakes, uh, my master's degree and goannas all kinds of stuff. So, I think you're going to get a lot out of it. Now, I got Ross on recently because he's doing a special fundraising sale of his 2022 calendar, his reptile calendar. 25% of the proceeds are going to be donated to the Royal Flying Doctors Service here in Australia. So, they are a service that flies planes into remote parts of Australia to help people who are injured or in trouble or who may have been bitten by a snake like Ross has. Check out the previous episodes to learn about that. And the Global Snakebite Initiative. So, the Global Snakebite Initiative is a non-profit charitable organization working hard on many levels to ease the burden of snakebite around the world. So, make sure that you go and check out these calendars, guys. They're only $35, but the proceeds go to a good cause and are going to help people who get in trouble in the bush. So, without any further ado, guys, let's get into this episode. G'day, you mob. Welcome to this episode of Aussie English. Today, I have third time appearance, Ross McGibbon, mate. I don't know. You might be the first number three interviewee to return. So, welcome back. Mate, <laughs> mate I'm honoured. I always enjoy our chats. Yeah. So, you've been on the other side of the, the um, what would you say, the Nullarbor plane. You've been over in WA avoiding all of the uh, shitstorm that is COVID in Australia. Pretty and- much, mate. Pretty much. Um has life yeah, been, been different or have you just been living it up like normal? Well, life's been, uh, I guess, fairly usual over here, you know, um, still being able to have the freedom to, to you know, get out and travel and do what we want. Um, yeah. Although every single trip that I've tried to take in the last probably two years or one and a half years has been hampered by COVID. Like um, the one in November last year, this time last year, I got... Um, 200 k's from the South Australia border and then had to um, turn around because my mates are ringing me going, don't go into South Australia. They've just they've just gone into lockdown. So, what, you get stuck there? Like you could enter well, but you'd have to go into um, quarantine for two weeks or something and then correct, WA would correct. be like, you're not coming back, mate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I had, I had a four-week trip and it wasn't worth, um, you know, I had a lot planned so it wasn't yeah. worth um, coming back and spending half of it in lockdown. So, didn't go to South Australia and uh, ended up going to the Northern Territory instead, and that was still good, you know, still still stuff there. So we're lucky with we've got neighbouring states that that we can jump over to. Whereas I, I do really feel for um, people in New South Wales and Victoria, like yourself, mate. Uh, what can you do? You just got to ride it. <laughs> ride it. That's yeah, it, mate. Get double jabbed. Have you had the vaccine yet? I have been. Yes, yeah, so I'm a firefighter, so it's um. I oh, mean, it's mandatory, just- is it? Well, they're just bringing, they've just brought out the mandate, but I got it done um, probably about eight weeks ago. So, how did, how did you um, feel about that? And have the, has there been a reaction from other firefighters or people in, in WA who've been sort of, you know, forced to get the, the um, vaccine in order to do their job? Because over here, obviously, yeah. we've had the virus a lot more. So, people are kind of probably a little more accepting of that kind of mandate to come through whereas in yeah. wa you guys have had bugger all cases right barely anything and so i can yeah. imagine there's more of a reaction of like why you know yeah i i do understand there's there's definitely arguments for both sides but when it came down to my rationale um i just did a personal list of of in my head sort of thing you know what are the pros and cons of getting it yeah and the cons were just too too far um yeah, too much. For, it's too much for me. Like not being able to travel interstate. Um, yeah. A, I need it for my job, uh, being defence and stuff like that. So, 
uh, it was really a no brainer for me. And the other thing is I've, you know, been in the army. So we, you know, when I jo- first joined the army, we were getting like, you know, four in a day, or, you know, really? stuff like that. Until uh, if we, you're going overseas or something. Yeah. Well, you get, you get jabbed with just about everything for, for local. And yeah. then before you go overseas, you get specific ones for overseas. So, you know, I'm young, fit, healthy, didn't have any worries with it. So I just went and got it done. And personally, I had zero side effects. Like Animal. A tiny, yeah, a tiny bit of um, pain at the local site where it was mm-hmm. jabbed and, and that's about it, like afterwards. But So not nah. even as bad as the snake bite that you copped back in the day? <laughs> not even as bad as the snake bite, no. Nah. <laughs> so, yeah, I can compare it to that. <laughs> yeah, probably one of the very few that, people who can. <laughs> that, that's a double jab as well. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say that brings a new meaning to be double jabbed, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Maybe if, that's if what if they I'm need. Not- they need just snakes that have been like genetically modified to carry the, the vaccine as venom and then they just let them loose on the, the population of Australia. <laughs> Well, just touching on that, they do use snake venom for a lot of uh, stuff, you know, so they, they use it in like blood clot medication yeah. and to help with strokes and heart attacks. And um, even I heard there was some research being done into how it can help with uh, breast cancer or something like yeah. that. So, um, yeah, snake venom is actually quite useful in that regard. And that's it, one thing that people nuts. overlook. It's nuts. I think I heard that about, is it the cone shell? Um the cone snail, right? That snail. That, cone shell, yep. Cone. Yeah, those those snails that have these sort of spiral cone-like sh- um, shells, I guess, hence the name, that live in, where would they live? Indonesia and the tropical waters up there in the north. And they create really complex venom. Might have lost him. Uh, and um, He's back. You there? They do, I think. I think you've frozen a bit there. Yep. <laughs> You're right. He's back. Yeah, they yeah, have the, here, apparently sorry. they have the most complex venom of any animal. I think they have something like one to 2,000 compounds in the venom that they create, and it's constantly changing. They're really variable in terms of how quickly yeah, right. their venom changes because they have to be able to kill things, different kinds of fish and crustaceans and all sorts yeah. of different animals all the time and really quickly because they're snails. Yep. And so it's just nuts yeah, how much they're that's studying. Fascinating. It. Yeah, they're studying it to try and learn about um yeah preventing cancer and everything. I was just like Jesus, snails, bloody hell, creepy as. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a, it's it's one of those things that people don't know about. Um, and you know, venomous creatures, you know, despite all the hype about them, they are quite useful. A just useful in the environment um, for pest control, and you know, being that middle order predator where they keep things other things in balance, and then. Yeah, you've got obviously the the fancy ways that we're figuring out how to utilize, you know, their compounds and and uh, help us as a species as well. Did, did you grow up with that kind of culture at home of if you have a huntsman in the house, just leave it alone, let it kill the other animals? Look, I mostly grew up with my mum and two sisters, and um, I can't rem- remember mum being overly, you know. <laughs> <laughs> phased about anything so it wasn't really like anything that was dangerous had to die but mm-hmm. c- certainly when I got out on the farm um, later in life I was about 11 years old when my mum met a farmer and uh, things got turned upside down when we moved out there and um, that's when I had to get used to the the, the old farmer prejudice of, of killing animals that that are an inconvenience or a perceived danger to you. <laughs> Yeah, I had that with my grandfather having that that sort of he has a farm up near Bendigo and I remember him finding a red belly black snake's nest under our house with um mm-hmm. I think newly hatched babies and so there were all these small red belly black snakes just around the house getting into it and he was just yep. like I don't want to but I'm going to have to kill these things because I'm not going yeah. around one by one catching all of them and then letting them go elsewhere. He's just like this is too dangerous for you kids. You're going to put your hand under something and get bitten. Oh, I do understand that, but if he if he realised how little threat red bellies yeah. are, and and also it wasn't a nest where you know they're going to stay there forever. So red belly blacks actually give birth to live young, or yeah, okay. or it's like an embryonic sac. So it's kind of in between an egg and live birth. That's right. Yeah, um, and they give birth to live young. So those he would have just witnessed that happen, and then because snakes are independent from pretty much day one, they would have all scattered. So, had he given it, you know, a week, he wouldn't have been <laughs> yeah, able to. that's it. He should have just know. said, everyone go. We'll just leave. Yeah. You know, there's other precautions they can take, but it just, 
it's just people don't know. Do you know yeah. what I mean? And it's hard. Like he's trying to do what's best for his family, but yeah. if he just educated himself a little more and he knew, like no one's ever died in Australia from a red belly black. So, aren't they one of those snakes that have a really, really high proportion of dry bites too, where they don't actually inject the venom with if and when they bite someone in a uh, defensive yeah, they, situation? Yeah, they like do. That? Yeah, they do have a high proportion. I don't have the stats in front of me, but, yeah. um, you know, if we look at the Eastern Brown, I, I know that one off by heart, and that's only 20 to 40% oh, really? um, envenomation rate. So, um, yeah, every 10 bites, there's only two to four people that uh, actually get envenomed from them. So a lot of people don't know about dry bites either, and that's a whole other um, thing. And basically just to... If no one's ever heard of a dry bite before, it's just when a snake bites defensively, they don't always uh, try to or are able to use their venom. And, um, yeah, a lot of the time people uh, come away with no envenomation. Because it's a massive um, waste, right? If they had a, they spend a lot of energy creating this venom that they need to use in order to hunt and if they're going to waste it on an animal that's clearly not prey, they have to then spend all this energy, extra energy building that, venom surplus up again to be able to go out and use so they're going to be like well why am i going to bother using this i just want it to go away go away (laughs) yeah yeah it is like that there there is there has been some studies done on death adders where Mm -hmm. they actually tested the metabolic rate and and how expensive or taxing it was to uh replenish the venom and it it's only it's not even as taxing as shedding their skin so shedding their skin is actually more taxing is that um, just because of the movement they have to go through in order to pull it off effectively, all of that no, movement? It's, or? It, it's probably the metabolic change that uh, they go through because they have to secrete a liquid under their skin yep. to sort of start to separate the new layer from the old layer. Yep. And that's why if you've ever seen a snake about to sloth its skin, it starts to go really dark and a bit opaque and that scale over the eye Yeah. Um, that starts to go really opaque and then um, the snake is under a bit of duress during that time. They they try and sort of hide and um, stay away from danger because they're, they're a little bit weakened, you know what I mean? If you've got this foggy scale over your eye, um, it's not the best to try and defend yourself or get away from a predator. So yeah, um, they'll tend to sort of bunker down until that metabolic, you know, change happens. But not to go too much into that, but... Um, Getting back to the costly venom production, um, that is one reason, or it's a theory that yeah. that's why snakes dry bite. But the other reason is snakes instinctively know, look, this is a big human. It's not a prey item. I'm in defense mode. And when they're in defense mode, it's their bites are last resort and they're instinctual. So if someone startles a snake and they're very close to them, uh, they may receive a bite but they don't realize that unless they're watching the snake they don't realize there's all this other behavior that they go through first there's rearing up there's mock strikes there's some snakes even headbutt yeah i've Um, seen that yeah i I had a black-headed python and it used to do that to me I, i remember and it would go through those shedding phases and have you know, the cloudy eyes and I would always be much more wary of putting my hand in the cage at that point because I'm like, especially yeah. during feeding, you're like, he, yeah. he can't see <laughs> very yeah, well. He so, can't. he'll just grab whatever comes at him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, it puts him into a bit of a state of like, um, I guess, a heightened state. Uh, they, they might get a little more nervous if, yeah. if, if they can't see very well or, or they don't have a confident ability to escape so well he a, was really thing. he was really cage defensive i i think yep. i got duped by the person who was selling him because i remember going when he was just a little snake and the guy was like yeah he's fine he's just really cage defensive you know he's, oh, there's nothing wrong with it and i'm yep. like well at the time it wasn't an issue when he was 30 centimeters long but by the time he was two and a half meters it was a bit of an issue <laughs> yeah but the thing is, can go sorry you go well the thing was when i put my hand into the cage quite often he would have a go at it but he never bit me and I, th- yep. I think he was just headbutting me. I don't think he was ever actually trying to latch on and, and yep. you know, do me harm, but was more like, you know, fuck off, like get out of my home. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's a defensive tactic by snakes. If they if they strike out, it, it, imagine a boxer who yeah. throws that, that fake punch and it gets you on the back foot. That's exactly uh, what the tactic is for snakes. They might lash out, but 
they intentionally don't hit their target. They fall short of it because that can break fangs. Um, if you're defending yourself with your mouth, yeah. like imagine imagine if you couldn't punch anyone and you had your hands tied behind your back, <laughs> just had you'd your be teeth. pretty re- you'd be pretty reluctant to throw your head at someone and and bite them as a you know as an offensive move. Whereas when uh, you get snakes that get that prey response and they they lock onto that smell they they just switch and they use all of their abilities so if they did that with humans there'd be no humans in australia mm-hmm. because you know the snakes would have wiped them out when they came here to settle but we're lucky they see us as a as a big predator and they'll do all this stuff they can do and biting is generally a last resort unless you step on the thing and mm-hmm. and and even then um when we were catching tiger snakes for my um, mate's PhD here, we had to go out season after season and catch many tiger snakes to measure them and tag them and test them and do all this with them. So we were, we were catching hundreds of tiger snakes and you would observe when you pin them, we used pinners, which are like, um, imagine a broomstick yep. and it's got, it's got a fork at the end of it. And between those two points is a leather strap. Yeah. To hold them down with and, gentle and pressure, right? Yeah. Gentle pressure to pin the snake, because if you're looking for them in long grass, imagine you've, everyone counts, you can't afford to let them get away because mm-hmm. you need them for the data. So you're using like a meter and a half stick with a pinner on the end of it. And you just lightly pin the snake in the long grass so that you don't have to you know, dive on it and it's just a bit safer. <laughs> you do the, but, the full Steve Irwin, grab the tail and just be like, whoa, we got a live one. Yeah, well, look, we, <laughs> you know, we, we could do that. Plenty of people do that outside. Plenty of snake handlers do that if they're going out to look for snakes and they want to catch them and get hands on. But this was a obviously a university study. So we had to do all the, the safety precautions <laughs> and the safest way of doing it is having a glove on yep. and a pinner. And as soon as you pin it, you reach down and grab it with a snake proof glove. But what the takeaway from this was, is we observed so many tiger snakes, we'd pin them and only probably 30% of them would turn around and try and bite the pinner. Really? And, and people are, are so, you know, they haven't, they don't know anything about tiger snakes, but the first thing that the general public says to me, if I mention the word tiger snake is, oh, aren't they aggressive? And we've done this study where we're actually physically pinning them and that's kind of likened to if you stepped on them. Yeah. Only around 30% of them actually turn around and bit the pinner. That's incredible um, considering that would be such a dangerous situation for a snake in terms of its, um, you know, if, if another animal or something pins that snake, generally it's going to be your dinner, right? That The snake's not going to be like, much. oh, yeah, they're just going there amongst their, <laughs> you know, doing their thing. It's fine. Yeah. I'll just wait for them to let go and leave. <laughs> Well, yeah, so, you know, because every one of them has a different temperament. Yeah. And and also there's other factors like how warm the snake is, how alert it is. Yeah. Like if we were catching them fairly early in the morning when they were basking. Clever boy. So some of them were cooler. <laughs> yeah. And, but they're a black snake, so they do heat up quick, pretty quick in the sun. And it was just amazing to witness what people perceive as a very dangerous snake and a very aggressive snake, um, us actually pinning them and not that many turned around and bit the pinner. Yeah. Um, different story when you reach down and physically grab it and pick it up, the snake's awake then and it starts to realise, hey, what the hell? But mm-hmm. there was that many of them that if we handled them gently, you could pick them up and they wouldn't actually bite the glove until you restrain them so that you could measure them. I and- think I've seen people free handling red belly black snakes before, at least um, like pet ones where they've raised them and yeah. you're like, Jesus, yeah. this thing's deadly and you're just holding it in your hands like without yeah. restricting it in any way, shape or form. Yeah. So, it obviously I, goes look, to show that they do have the capacity to not necessarily just go for your throat no matter what, right? Yeah, that's it's just sort of perceived fear really yeah. getting a hold of people's uh, imaginations and, and assuming that all snakes are bad and they're, they're out to get you and stuff like that. But when you actually learn about them, you realise they're just like any other wild animal They've got their defense mechanisms in the wild to keep them alive. And we just perceive that as aggression. I, I'm um, so, so much more happy living in Australia in terms of being able to go hiking and, and worrying about things yeah. like snakes as opposed to bears or cougars. Because it's almost oh, like yeah. you, you, you don't get a discussion with them, right? There's no, yeah. there's no kind of, um, you know, you walk up on them and they're the ones that are going to freak out and try and get away from you every single time. They have much more of a... Um, 
size advantage on you and, and probably less fear as a result, right? And the fact that yeah, you def- are prey. De- definitely, <laughs> like a, a human is prey to a bear. So, yeah. um, you know, there's, uh, you know, I'm not an expert on bears or anything, but um, if if a hungry one is out there and it and it wants to eat you, um, you can be ripped apart. Whereas a snake, everyone's so worried about our wildlife, thinking that it all all wants to kill you. And I think I've mentioned this many times before. We've only we only have about five deaths a year from yeah. all all our dangerous um, or dangerous native animals. Oh, the, yeah, uh, the the venomous ones, the ones that everyone always is scared shitless of, right? But then you're like, yeah, well, you're not that, worried about horses, and that kills that the majority includes, of people. <laughs> Yeah, that includes sharks, crocodiles, like even non-venomous animals. We have about five deaths a year. But yeah, um, yeah if you want to get into the stats, um, which I do in that in that 30-minute short film that I made. Um, so if anyone's interested to learn a lot more about the, situa- the snake situation in Australia and learn more about their behaviour, that 30-minute film on my YouTube and Facebook and everything is the one to go on, to go and look at. What's it like? So, you've been doing these trips around Australia because you collect these, collect, you create calendars by, you know, catching all the Pokemon using, using your, you know, incredible skills to find these rare animals and take brilliant photos of them. How often do you actually come across them? Is it the kind of thing where, you know, a city slicker like me might think, oh, he just goes into the desert and they're a dime a dozen, they're bloody everywhere? Or are they you know, just really cryptic, really difficult to find and you actually have to do your homework, know where to go, everything like that? Uh, Both. So, if you're in good weather and good conditions, uh, then you come across, like if I go up into the Pilbara region of Western Australia, that's sort of up around Karajini National Park and places like Tom Price and Newman. Um, It's about an 18-hour-ish drive from from Perth if I go up around there in good weather throughout say October through to March um, you do get snakes all over the roads at night time um, you know because it's really hot during the day Uh, they prefer early evening and and being basically nocturnal so you get all the common species all over the road and I've obviously photographed um, all the common stuff uh, a number of times and, and most of the time you're just moving it off the road or you, you're just having a look at it, see if it's doing anything interesting. Like you might find a python out on the road at night. It's just had a sprinkle of rain and they're out on the road eating frogs or something like yeah, that. Yeah, really. Or, or each other or, you know, then you get sometimes you get centipedes out on the road eating the roadkill and there's all this stuff wow. happening at night time. But yep. if I'm targeting specific animals that are more cryptic, then that's where you need to really do your research. So I need to know, you know, the time of day that they're or night that they're active, what what they feed on and what prey are they Jesus. most likely going for. I need to know weather conditions. Um, I need to know their range and their distribution where they are in Australia. Um, so before I go on my photography trips, you know, I'm researching for a good month or two beforehand and i'm writing a wish list and then i'm building up all the information i can on that species to find it and that increases my chances when i go on the trip because you know being a fire being a fiery i have to use my annual leave for these trips i'm not a full-time photographer to be nice but Mm -hmm. you just can't earn the living these days you know as some people used to but um, so I got to use my own personal leave for this stuff. So if I'm out spending all this money on fuel, um, taking four weeks of my hard-earned leave, I want to make sure that when I go out photographing, I'm, you know, targeting and, and getting as many species as possible. Whereas in the earlier days, you would just sort of go out and see what you what you could find. But you yeah. get smarter as you get older. Yeah, well, and I take it you probably get bored with the same shit, right? I mean, it was yeah. like when I got into bird photography. You, it's amazing the first time you go to, a, say, a wetlands and, and try and fo- take photo, photos of all these birds because you're just like, there's tons of them. But then pretty quickly, you're kind of like, I see these birds every single time I come here. I want to find something yep. different, something new, something rare, or maybe yep. a situation where something interesting is happening, right? Two different species are interacting or something's eating something, yep. and you're like, which are really, really rare. Um, yeah. okay. I think I saw there was a... Did you see that photo of the... Um, kingfisher diving straight down into water yeah you saw it where it's like perfectly aligned and the beak was just above the water 
and he'd blurred the yep. background out. It was just this phenomenal photo, really symmetrical. Yep. And yep. It, you see that and you're like, yeah, the guy's just a freak. And I think the the text was like, this took seven years and it was something like six million photos, um, yeah. you know, four cameras <laughs> that yeah. he effectively just burnt out from taking yep. hundreds of thousands of photos with each camera until it broke, trying yep. to get that one photo because he put himself in the right position each time and then just had to, it was just a crapshoot every time, especially with something that like bird photography where it's so fast. So, you have to kind of put yourself in the right position, yeah. wait for it to move or do something. And then you just do the of all the yep. photos and hope you look later and be like, did I get the right um, shot, that perfect shot where the wings are perfectly splayed out as opposed to, you know, tucked in or something whilst it's flying. Yeah. Imagine how many times he's uh, reviewed his images just to find it like yeah. the, head's, the head's too far away or it's too far down. And that's, you know, that's dedication and um, I it's could, a different um, sport, right, from from reptile photography because I think you put a lot more time and thought and energy into setting the shot up because you you are able to interact with the animal for a longer period of time, right? Like with a bird, it's just going to disappear. You, you know, it's got a certain flight distance and unless yeah. it's sitting on a nest, which you generally avoid taking photos of and harassing, it's going to do what it does and if you get too close, it's gone and you've got no control over it, right? There's no... I can walk around the bird and kind of harass it or, you know, make sure it stays in this area and line things up as much. Yeah, it's it's different. If you're going to compare the two, like uh, they really are two different beasts. Like reptiles just don't behave the same way as, the, you know, reptiles are more cryptic. Yep. So, um, you know, they're if I'm looking for a, a, a snake that's cruising around in long grass, like you, you have to put in the man hours to find that. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, bird photography you can sort of set up in well-known places or yes. you might, you know, if you know what you're doing, you might be able to identify a nesting site for that bird and then kind of do a stakeout kind of thing. Whereas um, reptile photography is a little bit different where you're, you're opportunistically finding animals mm -hmm. and then photographing them and where possible getting those shots where you can use a long lens and, and you can just get the behavior or the animal sitting out basking or something like that. But yeah. then there's other times when you're driving along at road at night and the thing is in the middle of the road sitting there and you're <laughs> like, I've got road trains coming, yeah. you know, and if it's a species that, you know, most of the time I'll just get out, get up and move the snake off the road. And that's actually how, you know, the, the bite story happened in, in 2017. But there's other times where that snake will be the one you've been looking for mm -hmm. for for years or months or whatever, and it's sitting in the middle of a road at night waiting to be run over. Well, or, how, do you, how do you feel you when know. that that moment happens? Like when you've that, been searching for so long for this one thing, do you do you get like a massive rush, a massive yeah. sort of adrenaline hit, and you're just like, oh my god, another Pokemon on the list yeah. to tick off? You know? <laughs> yeah, definitely. And then and then you get, you know, the that's the first interaction with the animal like if i have to catch the animal mm -hmm. and move it off the road or move it to somewhere safe to actually photograph it then you've got that whole interaction with the animal and you start to see another side to to snakes that the general public don't see so mm. often is the case if i've got to catch an animal to to interact with it and get a photo of it then i've got to work in close proximity to that animal and it's amazing when you know, they'll have their maybe initial defensive reaction to you, but you start to work with it and you start to be really calm and gentle around that animal and you and you see them start to recognise you as not a threat anymore. And What, do you, what do you reckon they think when they get to that point, right? Because I think I've seen a few of these videos with you where, you you know, you're interacting with a snake and at first it, it has that flight response generally. I don't think I've seen many where they've tried to strike at you. Normally, they're just trying to bail. But what do you think the snake, what do you think clicks or makes it realize that it's, that you're no longer a threat? Is it just, oh, okay, well, he hasn't tried to eat me or hasn't, I, I don't feel pain with this thing here. So, I guess it's not trying to harm me and just, it just relaxes. Like, I, I think so, mate. I think after a while, they, they just start to realize they, I think animals can definitely pick up on your energy. Yeah. And, and I think if you're frantic and you're, moving in that way and giving off that energy i think they can pick up on it yeah and i'll tell you a bit of a story because it ties in with the gut health stuff that i've been going through for about a year and a half or maybe about it probably a good 12 months 
I think I was probably giving off some some bad energy. I was in a relationship that was um, that was very stressful, uh, lots of fighting, lots of stuff going on, and I think I was giving off a bad energy for for about twelve months. And I was also suffering from the gut health stuff, which was affecting my mood and my my hormones. And I just remember for a good twelve months there, photography was hard. You know what I mean? The animals that I was working with was um they were rarely cooperating they were rarely being calm in my presence and i also had my friend buy a dog at the time and she was off me from the start and i've never had any animals be off me and from the start she was off me for a good year As and then didn't i didn't want to come near you or well was it quite aggressive she was a rescue so she was a yeah. bit scared when she came into her house but she was just picking up on my energy and she was avoiding me um, for the first month, she was quite aggressive to me. She would like get scared and, you know, come at me barking and stuff like that. And it was, it was really odd and we couldn't really figure it out. And it wasn't until I got to the end of this sort of journey and I got my health back and I got out of that relationship that I was having trouble in. And uh, I just got myself back and I just started feeling lighter and happier and, and just me again. And then I started going on photography trips again mm. and all of a sudden it was fun again. The animals were cooperating. They were more often than not, they could pick up, I think, on the energy I was giving off and, and stay relaxed in my presence. And yeah, it's a bit, you know, airy fairy because you don't know for sure, but I, I definitely think that um, they can pick up on, on your energy. I've heard that, you know, and with a lot of different animals, I'm sure there's probably a varying degree, but definitely with animals like horses and, and dogs and cats and stuff, I think they can tend to work it out pretty quickly whether or not you're, you know, calm and relaxed and just going to interact with them in a nice, friendly way or not. Yeah. Well, I put it this way, like if you're walking down the street and you've got a really rough, you know, character walking towards you, you know, they're really rough and they've just got that energy that's bad. Do you know what I mean? You, yeah. you look at them and it's just coming like, you know, you just feel like you're unsafe mm -hmm. just even walking past them. Like people, people would see that all the time. You know, we can pick up on it. I think animals are even better at it. So, Well, and they um, have to be, right, because they don't have yeah. verbal communication or anything like that. They have to be able to see and just know what's happening around them with the other animals that are interacting yeah. with them. Yeah, so, you know, if you ever see my short clips where I'm where I'm showing how close I get when I photograph venomous snakes and that you, you will see that um, and even the latest monitor video I put out I'm not sure if you caught it on Instagram this it is only, with the Kimberly rock monitor yeah, was it Kimberly rock monitor yeah and, this and tiny how, little thing I was I was like oh wow like because a lot of these I did my master's degree on Varanus varius yep. the lace monitor yeah so I spent a lot of time learning about um, these varanids but I never I think I've probably only seen a handful of them in real life and so it was really cool to see this right next to you were sitting up on this ledge in front of this uh was it a ravine or something with a river below it yeah we were canoeing it's the ord river yeah and, uh, we we're ca canoeing um up the river and there's a, a rock where you can sort of stop for lunch and and jump off it if you want to and we went up the top there and uh jumped off the rock and when i came back up this um little juvenile rock monitor had sort of heard the commotion and you know obviously that's a pretty quiet spot usually and it's mm. heard the commotion and it came out to to have a look what was going on and, and meet these humans that was hanging out there whereas more often than not it's the other way around where the the older individuals are a bit more savvy they're a bit more predator aware um and they they might be gone at the first sight of you but um yeah it, it's amazing i was amazed and, that he was just sitting there yeah it because you were right next to it and yep. from when I was uh, hunting down tree goannas, which are the largest Australian goannas, they were never comfortable being anywhere near you unless they were a large male at a campsite who frequently got into the bins. Yeah. So, you'd yes. go to campsites so and you'd have this 20 kilo fucking monster yep. and you'd be like, he's not afraid of anyone, Jesus Christ. Like, <laughs> don't yeah. let him come near the tent. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and that they were my first monitor because I was uh, growing up on the Gold Coast hinter uh, yeah. on the Gold Coast, and we would visit the Gold Coast hinterland, and mm -hmm. I'd be following them around, getting too close, trying to touch them, and they'd whip me with their tail. Yeah, and, it's weird, um, isn't it? They hiss yeah. and they they curl the tail yeah. right up into this yep. reflexive kind of position, and they'll hit yep. you with it to, to yep. be like, get out of here. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and one of those whips across the, the legs as a kid when, when it's a, you know, a good 25 kilo animal or something like this, mm-hmm. you're, you're in pain. And I've actually had a parenti do it to me Jeez. and um, actually draw blood. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're so, brutal. I've got, I've still got a scar here. I don't know if you can see it, but I got bitten by one of them when we were, because we used to have to use dog poles. So, to, yep. get, to get them down, we would try and get them on a tree, dog pole them or in a trap and have to use a dog pole. Like, literally what you would see out of, you know, those, those movies where they have to put the rubber ring around the dog's yeah. neck to control it. And you'd have to duct tape its legs to its tail and then work your way up mm-hmm. the body, duct tape its, uh, its hands together in the prayer position. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, tell, us, tell us where the money is. <laughs> and then you'd have to duct tape the mouth so that it couldn't yep. bite you. Yep. And they've because these ones, at least lace monitors are tree climbers, their claws are just insane. They look like they've got raptors claws, right? Like a, um, yeah. like a bird yeah. of prey. Yeah, they tear you up, you know. Oh, and they yeah. bite like hell too. And it's crazy. Mm. With reptiles, I think they bite differently from mammals because they kind of bite down and hold and just get- yeah. it, it like gets more and more intense. It's yep. not like they gnash at you. But with yeah. the goannas, they would bite onto the pole and it would be like they go a certain pressure, then they go harder, then they go harder, and then they go harder and the teeth would break in their mouth and you and yeah. they wouldn't care and you'd just be like, this is fucking terrifying if that thing gets yeah. a hold of me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like- <laughs> exactly. Imagine- Yep. Imagine yeah. that getting a hold of you and not letting go. But yeah, l- luckily I've never been bitten by anything of decent size, goanna wise. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been pretty close to some. But um, you know, I've had one lunge at me, and the same thing as a snake. They'll they'll lunge. At, actually, I've had a few lunge at me. The bigger ones, they'll charge at you, mm-hmm. or they'll just take a quick lunge at you, and they know that they're not going to bite you around the neck or bite you on the face. They pull up about a, a foot short yeah. and then they're gone. So as soon as they see you take this big lunge back, that's what they're looking for and the then they're gone. window to escape. Yeah, and it's just, a, it's just a predatory defense mechanism. Quick charge, get out of there. Well, they're pretty crazy. Isn't it? I think- Give them that extra second, you know? Sorry, it broke up. What did you say? Sorry, an I extra lost second to get away, and that's what they're that's what they're after. I lost you there for a sec. What did As you say? You got- that's right. Um, I was just saying that that initial lunge at you gives them the extra second that they yeah. need to get away. And when you see that behavior, and you actually start to notice when you see part, like if the if the average person sees a big goanna or a snake charge at someone, they instantly think yeah. that that animal means them harm. When you start to understand their behavior, you realize it's a defense mechanism for a larger predator. They charge at them or they mock strike at them and then they hightail it out of there. And and if you take four steps back because this thing's just charged at you, you're going to then take another four steps to chase it. So it gives them that time they need to get away. Have you seen that stuff with elephants in, in Africa where there'll be someone, you know, a safari guide or whatever taking a group out? And they'll suddenly walk around a you know a tree or something and stumble upon a lone male elephant, and mm-hmm. the safari guide will just stop and be like, "No one run, <laughs> like yep. don't you dare turn around and bail." And yep. the elephant will like I think there's a video out there on YouTube of this where the elephant will be picking stuff up and throwing it, making noise, and then charges right yep. up to the front of the guy, and the guy doesn't move. You know, if yep. anything, he walks forward. And then the elephant's yep. just like, okay, turns around and eventually walks off. And you're yep. like, that's crazy. He was sort of testing you to see, are you going to yeah. turn around and run and either leave and leave me alone or am I going to chase you down and mess you yep. up? Yeah. So, and, that, and that's all it is, man. It's just, um, you know, they, they don't know what other animals are that are strange to them. Um, you, you know, probably in the case of wild animals like Africa, that they can identify like lions and, and other predators that are in their realm. But you got humans going into the bush, and I'll take Australia, for example, and you come across a snake mm-hmm. and it's and it's never seen a human before. Yeah. Or maybe it has and it's been chased or it's been it's seen this human freaking out and chasing it with a shovel or trying to kill it with a stick or something. They just see you and they don't know what you are. You're just bigger and you're just a threat. Oh, they're probably thinking shade. Oh, my God. Big shade standing up. Bail. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So, you know, you stay still. You can be indiscernible from a tree or anything else. But as soon as you move and start acting acting frantic, 
you're a threat to that animal. All right, so that's it for today's episode, guys. Thanks so much for joining me. Don't forget to go and grab yourself a copy of Ross's calendar. He's doing this as a fundraising event. Remember, trying to raise money to help people who get in trouble in Australia and need the Royal Flying Doctor's service or people overseas who get bitten by snakes and need some help as well, whether it's treatment, anti-venom, all that sort of stuff. So, you can go and get it from rmrphotography.com.au. And remember, it's a bargain. It's just $35 and you're going to get 12 absolutely phenomenal photos from around the country in Australia of different animals. A lot of them really venomous snakes. So, anyway, guys, thanks again. Make sure to check out the other episodes in this series when they come out. And I'll see you next time.